But I really do want to start with um, acknowledgement of the Turrbal and Yagara as the First Nations of uh, owners of the land where QUT now stands. Uh, and I'd like to pay my respect to the elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. Um, I really do recognise that these lands have always been um, places of teaching, research and learning. Um, a special thank you to the amazing organising committee too for um, their incredible uh, pulling together and very efficient pulling together this conference. Um, and uh, yeah, I will learn my lesson about daylight savings now being in Queensland. Okay, so um, I'm an environmental social scientist and I've been doing research for over a couple of decades, but it was later in life that I decided to do my PhD. And I became, uh, this is not sharing, sorry, this is not moving. There we go. Uh, I became interested in um, the role that citizen science might play in engaging Australians more broadly in science. Um, so that was really what my PhD was focused on. And in a nutshell, the um, answer to my research question was that um, certainly mainstream citizen science was more likely to engage people who are, um, already hold pro-science attitudes um, and have higher education and probably a lot of the things that you've already heard from, from Ruth um, along the way. So that work led to an amazing opportunity to do a postdoc over at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in the US. Um, I've just spent, I've just finished two and a half years over there. Um, I'm assuming most of you know about the lab um, and its world leading research. It was also home until recently um, of Rick Bonney, who was the director of the public engagement in science program there at the lab. So, a lot of my work at the lab was really thinking about how we engage um, uh, a wider audiences in citizen science. And many of the studies I did focused on Project Feeder Watch. Um, one of the main things that I was examining is um, why younger people were underrepresented in this project. And I'll talk to you about that a little more as we go. Um, I've also had the great pleasure, I don't know if you know the man with, waving his arms, this is Martin Thiel and his team in Chile. Um, we've been working on a marine citizen science project over there to examine public perceptions of marine litter in 11 Latin American countries. And that's been um, a, a very rewarding and exciting project as well. Okay, so what I wanted to dive into um, today with you is to look at some of the common assumptions and claims that we hear about citizen science. Um, we're still hearing them um, being made on Twitter today. If you follow some of the, the hashtags for the conference, you'll see some of them. Um, and then, then look at the ways that research about citizen science can um, examine some of these claims and help the field to move forward and make some real progress. So before I launch into these claims, I want to issue a warning that due to this brief presentation, I will be making some broad sweeping generalizations, um, but I do know that there are always exceptions to some of these. So keep that in mind as we go along. Okay, assumption one, that citizen science is for everyone, or sometimes we hear citizen science is for all. And um, as you've heard from Ruth, that is simply not the case for, for many groups. So if we look at the evidence around this, we can see um, in research, particularly about mainstream projects. Now I'm avoiding calling them contributory for a reason. Um, I can explain that later on if you're interested, but these really mainstream projects um, are often attracting people who are highly educated. They're usually white. Um, and as I've already mentioned, they hold pro-science attitudes already. Um, and some may even be um, uh, trained in science itself, but not necessarily working as scientists. Again, as we've heard from Ruth, um, structural inequalities are still preventing participation in um, many projects. And even in these really well-intentioned um, projects that are, are trying to be inclusive by being open and free or um, accessible in different ways, um, 
uh, we have to acknowledge that there are other issues going on that are preventing um, people's p participation from certain groups. So there are some amazing projects out there that are working with groups who are maybe non-scientists or they're from lower socioeconomic or um, minority groups. But what we see is that they really need to work quite differently. And um, this, this becomes really important if we're looking at progress in the field uh, because it's very intensive work often. Um, they're reaching much smaller numbers of people, but they can have really profound impacts as well. So the question we want to ask ourselves here is, um, how does the design of the project and the recruitment strategies influence people who participate? An example um, uh, about recruitment strategies is going back to the Feeder Watch project. I was examining, um, as I said, the reasons why young people don't get involved um, to the same extent as older people. And what a lot of the younger people in my interviews told me is that they don't see themselves um, as part of these groups because they're mostly made up of older people. But we also inadvertently send out signals through our recruitment messages um, using images of, of older people um, that, that really is quite off-putting to, to groups who are not like those in their um, images and, and videos and so on. Okay, let's leap into the second assumption. Um, this one's, this one, there's a strong push in the, in the field. If you're paying attention to the literature, you'll see that um, it's kind of the, the gold standard, or it's suggested that the gold standard is that participants get involved in all steps of the scientific process. Now, what we see though, um, particularly when we're looking at um, research on mainstream projects or interest or hobby based project is that people actually prefer data collection um, most out of all the roles that we can contemplate for them um, in this scientific endeavor. Now this isn't just my own research, I'm also talking about others um, in the US and, and Europe in particular. Um, what we do see sometimes if we ask different groups, they might actually be interested in different activities. Um, an example from my uh, marine citizen science research in Australia is that um, after data collection being the most preferred, uh, the um, uh, fishing, fishers, fishing people, fish, fishermen, um, uh, said that they preferred to get involved in communicating the findings of projects, whereas scuba divers preferred to get involved in some of the data um, analysis and processing and so on. Um, now, in contrast, issues-based projects, and by this I mean maybe um, projects that have um, arisen due to perhaps a public health issue, um, the role preferences may be much more diverse, um, but what we really need to do is understand people's interests and their needs um, in those projects. And we should be thinking about what is it that the target audience wants from participation. Um, I think it's quite damaging to the field if we um, suggest, as it is alluded to sometimes, that these larger um, data collection focused projects are somehow not so good. Okay, we'll switch to the third assumption, and that is that um, citizen, citizen science increases participants' knowledge about science, you know, more broadly. Um, th this is an interesting claim. Um, I'll explain why. What we see from research about citizen science is that in many cases, this procedural knowledge of science doesn't actually change. What happens instead is that factual knowledge about the topic that the um, project is about, so maybe marine litter or water quality or birds, um, that's the type of knowledge that usually increases. But we shouldn't really be surprised at this finding, and that's largely because um, many of these projects are not um, being established to explicitly teach science or the process of science. Um, so I can't help feel a bit baffled that somehow or another we expect that, that, that participants will be magically um, uh, sort of taught um, why we do things the way we do. Um, 
Another issue in this particular realm is that um, sometimes our measures of knowledge change are also the problem, um, particularly if people's knowledge is actually already high about some of um, about like the process of science or, or other things that we're focusing on. So the question I'd like to reflect on there is our, are our expectations of citizen science outcomes really realistic? All right, and the fourth and final assumption I want to explore with you um, is a bit of a personal favorite and a bug barrel at the same time. Um, and that is that research on citizen science um, participants is easy. Let's just do a survey. Surveys are easy, right? Well, it seems that if we look at what's going on in the field and I've spoken to many other um, social scientists who review literature um, uh, submitted about citizen science is that methodological um, problems are really not uncommon. Um, so that, that raises a lot of alarm bells for, for social scientists. When I say social scientists, I meant to say that I'm including the humanities here. Um, sometimes we don't always uh, talk about um, the two being the same. Uh, however, quality social research really requires training and experience in the social sciences. Um, we've seen some pretty awful surveys, I have to say, um, go out there and um, I, I'm personally concerned about the damage that that does to, to progress in the field. Um, some of the common problems that we see include poor question wording, um, unreliable measures, so um, uh, when researchers don't necessarily understand how to put a question and appropriate responses together, um, and sometimes completely inappropriate analyses, which then lead to problems about the um, conclusions that they're drawing from this, these studies. A massive issue that we all need to be aware of in survey work now is survey fraud. And I mean um, humans as well as bots. Bots are becoming a, a, a really um, huge concern in online surveys. So if you're advertising your survey, as we see often in citizen science, but also other fields, um, if you're advertising it anywhere on social media, um, online platforms, or anywhere that someone um, that you don't know you can get hold of the link, you have to expect now that bots are also taking those surveys. And I mean surveys that are not paid for um, as well. They're teaching their algorithms um, uh, how to, to take surveys for, for paid surveys later on. So uh, this is an issue that's also largely unaddressed in manuscripts. Um, we want to hear about um, how you've gone about ensuring that you've minimised the chance that there's fraudulent responses in your survey now too. So the question we want to reflect on here is, is our research on citizen science really of the highest possible standard? Now for any researchers out there, um, there are lots and lots of other claims and assumptions that we can challenge. Um, as I alluded to, there were some interesting ones on Twitter to, um, over the last couple of days, my personal favourite being um, that paying participants increases data quality. I very much doubt that's the case. Um, but there's lots and lots of other ones that you can explore as well. So just to leave you with some final thoughts, um, if, you, if you're working in this area, um, it's, it's really valuable to sit back and reflect upon um, the assumptions or claims that um, maybe you're making or you're hearing about citizen science and really ask yourself, is there any evidence to support this? If not, perhaps that's a really great research question for you. If, if you're a researcher, um, I see lots and lots of opportunity here. And just finally, um, we really do need to make sure that we're um, endeavouring to do the best quality research that we can to inform progress in the field. Um, so if you're not a social scientist, ask around. Um, there will be plenty of people out there who can help you, but make sure they get involved right from the beginning. Don't take them on at the end. It's much more difficult to do um, quality work at the end of the, the process. So thank you everyone for your time today and I wish you all the very best with your research. Thanks.